All righty, maybe we can get started. Um, it's really a wonderful pleasure to have uh, Atish visiting us again. Um, uh, always terrific to see you. And you'll be telling us about uh, quantum entanglement and string theory. We will be taking Atish out to a uh, dinner. Um, let's uh, gather in the lobby around 6, 615. Um, and then uh, um, uh, anyone who actually wants to go, uh, just email me. So I have uh, some idea of. Uh, uh, anyway, take it away. Okay, it's a pleasure to be back here. Let me wait for this to lock in. Yeah, so today I will uh, talk about some work done in collaboration with the uh, uh, postdoc at the uh, ICTP, Komandya Matra. I'll talk about quantum entanglement based on these two papers that should be coming out this week, uh, quantum entanglement and string theory. Uh, and uh, so I will maybe spend the third of my talk just to explain why this problem is interesting. Then uh, I'll describe the uh, method for computing quantum entanglement in string theory, which is a kind of a generalization of the Pika trick, which uh, has some divergences. And then I will explain how these divergences can be uh, mastered to get a finite entropy. So let me start a bit with the background of why entanglement entropy is of interest in quantum gravity. It's of course of fundamental importance in quantum mechanics. In quantum field theory, but I would say even more so in quantum gravity. And however, we really don't have a definition of quantum entropy in the context of quantum gravity. So the question that I want to address is if, can we define a notion of entropy? And uh, as we, I think, as everybody knows here, that the finiteness of entanglement entropy is in some ways at the heart of the information paradox in black hole physics. So, for example, uh, if you could define an analog of the von Neumann entropy in quantum gravity, yeah, so the question is, can we define an analog of the von Neumann entropy in quantum gravity in particular, in some finite theory of quantum gravity, like string theory? Uh, because if you try to define something like the von Neumann entropy, let's say for a black hole, then by the usual procedure, you would trace over the degrees of freedom in the black hole interior, to obtain some kind of a density matrix for the degrees of freedom outside, rho out. And then if you compute the von Neumann entropy uh, minus trace rho log rho, one finds that that entropy diverges. This is a well-known area divergence of entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. And But this would suggest then by the usual correspondence between us for a bipartite system with entanglement, somehow the number of qubits stored by the in, in the interior of the black hole are can be infinite and thus this then would look like the source of the uh, so let's just quickly remind ourselves of the quantum entanglement and quantum mechanics so so the classic example of course is the bell pair with the spooky uh, EPR and long distance quantum correlations. If you take a pair of photons in some spin zero state, which is, uh, high, is uh, uh, maximally entangled, you can have one going to the left, one going to the right, and uh, 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 it's up, down, minus, down, up. And the Hilbert space is a bipartite Hilbert space, it factorizes into left and right. And this is very different, as we know from an unentangled but pure state, which is both spins up or both spins down or one spin up and down. And this entanglement one would like to understand uh, is captured by the entanglement entropy. This fact that whether the state is entangled or not entangled. So given a state psi, which is normalized to one, one can define a density matrix, which is normalized to one. And then the reduced density matrix is just to uh, trace over the left uh, Hilbert space, 
the particle that has gone through, let's say, Andromeda galaxy. And that partial trace will give you a density matrix for the right Hilbert space, the particle which stays here. And uh, it's sufficient to, if you are only interested in making measurements in this room, then we don't need to know about what is happening with the particle in the Andromeda galaxy. So we can basically, it's sufficient for studying all the local correlations of some operators in the state by doing using this reduced density matrix. So we don't need to, uh, we can then perform the trace only over the Hilbert space that is accessible to us. And uh, the maximality of entanglement is, uh, uh, the degree of entanglement is measured by this fine grade for Neumann entropy, uh, which in this, for this particular case is just half one one, because the state was entangled. And then entanglement entropy is log two, which is basically giving you a measure of the dimension of the Hilbert space which you have traced over. Now, if you, if you try to do the same thing in quantum, uh, in quantum field theory, so you have a wall and you trace over the degrees of freedom on the left of the wall and try to uh, get a reduced density matrix for the measurements that are being performed in this room. So one can divide space into x less than zero and x greater than zero. And there can be a transverse directions y. Uh, and let's just pretend that the Hilbert space is uh, essentially factorized between the left and the right. And we run through the same kind of uh, manipulations working in the Minkowski vacuum. Then one finds that the entanglement entropy now instead of being finite is infinite. And this is the famous area law with the interval in divergence which is proportional to the area of this uh, entangling surface, which is area divided by some ultraviolet cutoff. And it's uh, easy to write down a path integral uh, uh, way to calculate this. You basically, you can think of the Minkowski vacuum wave function in some field basis. So you can divide the field basis as the left fields that are localized in the left part on the other side of the wall and the uh, ones which are localized on the right side of the wall. And uh, you'll get some functional of this kind, which is a functional of this boundary condition, phi L of x, phi L of, phi L of right. So path integral in the lower time strip is a functional of these field values. So that gives you this wave functional of a ground state uh, corresponds to the wave functional of the kept uh, omega in the field basis. And uh, similarly for the bra, you just do the path integral on the upper, bringing it back in time. And therefore, there is a very simple formula that one gets for the density matrix in the field basis that you just want to trace over the left degrees of freedom. So you just identify these two and uh, do the trace. So this can simply be done by doing this path integral where you summing over the left moving field states. And that corresponds to doing this path integral because now this phi left and, uh, sorry, I did, uh, I'm tracing over, maybe I'm wrong, right, maybe. Yeah, I think I've traced over the, they just flip the variables. So you, you know, basically you trace over this part of the, and therefore they are joined. There is no longer a branch cut. And you are left with phi left and phi left. So it's phi right and phi right prime. And there is a branch cut at this point. And the path integral over the cut plane with, gives you a simple formula for the density matrix. This is basically the density matrix. Uh, okay, row left, uh, so row right, phi left prime. So this is, you can think of it as a, uh, in the field basis, uh, uh, matrix representation of the density matrix. And uh, it's clear that you can think of this as one way to think about it. If you think of it as a Hamiltonian evolution, the evolution in, with a rotation. So you start with a state uh, phi right. I'm sorry about this. You have to just flip everywhere with this L is right. You start with phi right and you go around the circle and you uh, measure with respect to phi prime uh, right. So this is the way you can do it. And then you can similarly define 
the nth power of this density matrix simply by just doing this by con considering an n fold cover of the plane. So I'm just re reviewing some of the basic uh, uh, constructions in this because we will use this uh, in the string, string theory context. So this allows you to define uh, the Rennie entropy, for example. So you can consider the partition function of uh, trace rho hat to the power n, which will be a path integral in this manner that I described, where you connect the lower lip to the upper lip as one normally does for a demand sheet. And this is, you can think of it as a replica method because you're taking n copies uh, of the density matrix and you're evaluating trace rho to the power n rather than just computing trace rho or trace rho log rho because log rho is a difficult quantity to compute. This is the uh, idea behind the replica method. So you can, instead of computing the trace rho log rho, this path integral gives a simple way to compute trace rho to the power n. And then by taking a derivative with respect to n and setting n equal to one, and using this formula, we can get the entanglement entropy, the uh, form Norman entropy. Of course, uh, note that we had an n sheeted cover. So we need some notion of an analytic continuation of this formula in n. If you're able to get that analytic continuation only, then we can take the derivative. Now it's actually worthwhile thinking about this whole thing in Lorentzian signature. So if you go to Lorentzian space, the rotation becomes a Lorentz boost. So we naturally are led to the Rindler wedge, the Euclidean. So you can think of the plane as a Euclidean Rindler wedge. Uh, and here you have a, a D minus two dimensional transfer space. You suppose you had over in 10 dimensions, then you have a Rindler wedge here, and there's a vertical space is eight dimensional. And uh, your rotation becomes a Lorentz boost, but by a continuity, the Lorentz boost is going this way in the right linear wedge, and it is going this way in the, it's going backwards in time in the left linear wedge. So it's basically a combination of Lorentz boost in the right and the left. Now, uh, it's easy to understand in this picture why one has a, a divergence in the entropy, because one way to think about is in terms of the Unruh effect, that you have a temperature uh, the observer experiences, observer in the Rindler wedge experiences a very hot bath, whose temperature, uh, the uh, proper temperature goes as one upon one divided by two pi x, where x is the distance. So as you can see, as x goes to zero, the temperature is diverging here. And this is basically the bifurcate horizon in the language of Lorentzian uh, Penrose diagrams, because these two horizons are intersecting here. And essentially all the physics, non-trivial physics of black hole the thermodynamics comes from this point, because one intuitive way to think about it is that if you have a quantum fluctuation in Minkowski space-time going, going around like that, uh, as far as the Rindler observer is concerned, that uh, fluctuation lives forever. So even though it was a quantum fluctuation from the Minkowski observer, for the Rindler observer, it looks like a particle which is living forever. And moreover, as you approach this bifurcate horizon, the frequency or the wavelength of this fluctuation is becoming shorter and shorter. So the frequency is becoming higher and higher, and therefore the temperature is going up. So basically the temperature diverges, and that's the reason for this ultraviolet divergence. So this you can uh, make it more, uh, you can derive this rather quickly, because you just look at the Minkowski space time in the Rindler coordinates, uh, where time is defined by some uh, cosh and uh, shine uh, sine hyperbolic and cos hyperbolic. Under the weak rotation, you get a periodic Euclidean time uh, and rho squared theta has to be periodic with period two pi, and that allows you to derive this uh, relationship. But the temperature has to go as uh, two pi times x, one over two pi x. Okay. Uh, now, the right uh, density matrix is basically the four exponential of this minus two pi k right, which is the, and therefore you can think of this as the inverse temperature. Now, it's easy to see there is an entropy density for the uh, gas, 
whose uh, entropy density goes as temperature to the power d minus one. And since the temperature is diverging as one upon x, you get a total entropy which diverges. When d greater than one, it goes as uh, area divided by epsilon d minus two. Uh, sorry, my for d equal to one, it goes as c. D is the space spatial dimension. So this is the origin of the UV diversions. And another way to think about it is it because you have strong correlations in quantum field theory, uh, and you are sort of putting a very wall, and you are tracing over the degrees of freedom. And the derivative term, for example, for normal quantum field theory, box phi, wants you to have this sort of think of them as spin variables to be aligned. And you are sort of breaking that correlation, and that's the reason for this divergence. Uh, one can uh, make a connection very quickly with the just to go very quickly by with the uh, with the bell pair that we talked about earlier. If you can do the mode expansion of the free field in terms of the usual Minkowski modes, or you can do the mode expansion in terms of the left Riddler modes and the right Riddler modes. So you have basically two sets of uh, uh, creation and narration operators B for the Riddler observer, B and B tilde, whereas for the Minkowski observer is just A, A omega for every frequency. So the Minkowski observer is defined as A omega acting on that capital omega equal to zero, uh, and the Riddler uh, vacuum is defined in this way. But because of this exponential map, when you take the uh, E to the minus I omega T, which is the uh, Frequency, uh, the frequency modes in Minkowski uh, space time, uh, it comes out to be a mi mixture of positive and negative frequencies. And this leads to the Bogoliver transformations. I mean, you can either think in terms of the creation or narration operators or the positive and negative frequency modes. If you think in terms of the positive and negative frequency modes, it's just a simple exercise and Fourier uh, expansion. And you reduce that A omega is a combination of a creation, uh, annihilation operator and a creation operator. And since we are demanding A omega should be zero, we get an equation like that. But if you think of, uh, since uh, B tilde and B commute, you can think of this just as a constant. It's like a coherent state for the B oscillators. B, os B oscillators acting on beta is an eigenvalue of the beta. So this you can very easily solve using the normal coherent state. It's uh, beta is e to the minus beta b dagger, and then you replace beta by this combination. So that gives you this uh, well-known squeeze state, which looks like this. So basically, the uh, Minkowski vacuum is like a collection of bell pairs, where uh, a pair, one pair has gone to the left and the other to the right. Now, this divergence, I just want to very quickly uh, summarize uh, a bit about the algebraic QFT because this divergence indicates that we did something wrong and we were not really supposed to factorize the Hilbert space in this manner. So it's not really quite correct to assume that the Hilbert space is a factor uh, H right plus H left because of the strong correlations at the boundary. However, so therefore, one cannot really talk about von Neumann entropy in quantum field theory in this manner. Uh, and one has to, but there is a more uh, formal way of doing it, which uh, using algebraic QFT, which does not need, for certain observables, it does not need you to talk about uh, putting an ultraviolet cutoff. So even though the Hilbert space is not factorized, the algebra of local observables is nevertheless factorized. So you can have observables in the right Riddler wedge and the left Riddler wedge, and they commute with each other. And uh, this algebra of local observables is the, uh, what is called the von Neumann algebra, but it's basically has some boundedness properties and is closure under conjugation, and it is closure under some weak limits, in, in much rather like how we define the Hilbert spaces, where you include the limits of the, when you add some vectors, so uh, under these conditions, there is a Tomita Takesaki theory, but all that I mean it from here is that uh, using that Tomita Takesaki theory, you can get a pattern of a modular Hamiltonian, 
And in this simple example, for a free field, the modular Hamiltonian is nothing but uh, Riddler Hamiltonian of the right wedge. So you basically uh, formulate everything in terms of this algebra of observables. And in this language, the fact that uh, we, we get this ultraviolet divergence uh, can be stated as a statement about the nature of this algebra. And uh, the type one algebra admits an irreducible representation. So for example, if you had a bipartite system in quantum mechanics, and if you look at observables only restricted to the right uh, part of the Hilbert space, then it clearly admits an irreducible representation on the right Hilbert space. Whereas type three, which is of the kind that you're encountering here in quantum field theory, uh, it does not admit such a representation because if A right did have a representation, then it would commute, this commutator would tell you that it would be this identity, it would be shoots them out, tell you. So the divergence of the entangled entropy can be stated in this algebra QFT as a property of the algebra. This was a point emphasized by Witten that it's a property of the fact that the algebra of observables is type three and not type one. And this is a property of the algebra and not of the state. However, you can define many quantities which are free of this divergence. And one such quantity that has become important, I just want to move to now the uh, use of this entanglement entropy and gravity. And I want to take a couple of examples. So I just want to and then explain why the finiteness of entropy is important. So you can define quantities like the relative entropy, for example. So you take two density matrices and you can define the density matrix S rho uh, relative entropy uh, rho with respect to sigma as trace rho log rho minus rho log sigma. And log sigma can be taken to be minus 2 pi k. This is the uh, uh, modular Hamiltonian or the Rinder Hamiltonian that we talked about for a ground state. And trace rho log sigma therefore can be thought of, since this is a Hamiltonian, you can think of this like an energy term. And this other term is like the minus the energy, minus the entropy term. So this is the relative entropy is roughly like a fine grain version of field of um, free energy. It's some average energy minus temperature, one upon temperature times the uh, uh, sorry, temperature times the uh, entropy, average entropy. And this relative entropy has two properties: positivity and monotonicity that if you take, uh, it is always positive and it is monotonically increases under inclusion. So if the region V is bigger than U, then the this inequality is satisfied. Now, I'm, uh, let's now move to entanglement entropy and gravity. So this was just a very quick uh, update, uh, sorry, quick summer, uh, review of uh, Entanglement entropy in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory. Let's now come to entanglement entropy in gravity. So, for example, the strong subrelativity paradox that was pointed out by Mathur and uh, AMPS, uh, Almiri, Marov, uh, Polchinski, and uh, okay, AMPS, and then Papadimas and Raju, forget the last name, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. Uh, depends again on uh, to be our ability to define some kind of entanglement. So the, the way it goes is that okay, if the Hawking radiation coming out is entangled both with the modes here and modes here, then this uh, relative this uh, entanglement entropy plus this entanglement has to be bigger than uh, this combination. And uh, if you want the total en entropy to decrease, then one arrives at a contradiction. However, if you are finding uh, ultraviolet divergences, then it sort of puts this um, argument a bit under a shadow. And one would like to therefore have a definition and then a more complete theory, like string theory, where you can actually talk about it. Other application is the Bekenstein bound uh, by Cassini, where I will. It's not the one that I want to focus on. But another application where this uh, divergence actually is important to be dealt with properly is uh, Wall's proof of the generalized second, second law. So there is a very 
beautiful proof by Wall, Aaron Wall, about the generalized second law. And the, the way that proof goes, it uses this uh, relative entropy as the starting point and the monotonicity of the relative entropy as the starting point. Uh, however, which is a well-defined quantity, there is no ultraviolet divergence. But in the proof, one, has, one is required to separate out the energy term that I mentioned before and the entropy term. And then you use the energy term in the Einstein equation, the null right of the equation, and you relate that energy term, the change in the energy term to the change in area. And once again, it's a, it would be more satisfactory if you were able to find a definition of the entropy in some complete theory of quantum gravity where this quantity is actually finite so that you don't have to put some cut off by hand. I think these are a couple of motivations just to tell you why I think it's important. It would be very important and interesting if one can define something like that in quantum gravity. Of course, as we saw already in quantum field theory, we have problems defining entropy because of locality and so on. And in state, I mean, inserting some kind of a sharp uh, wall, as you saw, was already giving us trouble in quantum field theory. And in string theory, the notion of this uh, sharp wall is not really well defined. And one doesn't really have anything like the von Neumann algebra and so on. So one needs some uh, indirect method for even talking about some notion of entanglement entropy. And this is provided by, there's one possible method, and I will try to argue that it seems to do many things right, and uh, it could be taken as a definition of. So instead of considering the n-fold cover, as I described, you could take an n-fold cover and then do analytic continuation with that small n. You could take an order n or fold so with a deficit angle instead of a surplus opening angle. So if you took an n-fold cover, your total angle is going from 0 to 2 pi times small n. Whereas here, if you take an nth or fold, your total opening angle is 2 pi divided by n, where both capital N and small n are integers. And one can compute trace rho to the power capital N instead of as the partition function with the understanding that N is really like one upon N. And in fact, if you go back to the Rindler picture, it's clear that in this case, the temperature, instead of being one over two pi, it is N over two pi, so it's, it's at higher temperature. And uh, because just the periodicity is reduced from, instead of being two pi to two pi over N. So one is computing something like trace rho to the power N uh, using this order form. Uh, and then one can take a derivative if you, one could analytically continue in N uh, with this deficit angle. And there is a conical curvature singularity at the tip. So if you were doing canonical gravity, this is not even a good background. But it's actually rather very peculiar and interesting and non-trivial fact of string theory. But even though canonical gravity doesn't make sense in this background, string theory makes perfectly good sense because it is constructed as an exact and formal field theory. There is no singularity as one is used to uh, from the wonderful understanding that even though the geometric singularity, there may be geometric singularity, in many cases, string theory is actually perfectly non-singular. And therefore, uh, one can, in principle, define this uh, logarithm of the, so I just want to make a distinction between the space-time partition function and the world sheet partition function. So as is well known, the space-time partition function, the logarithm of the space-time fun partition function is the world sheet partition function. It's basically one way to think of it is like a Wicks theorem that you, you know, when you have vacuum bubble diagrams, you exponentiate them with the space-time diagrams. And that exponential gives you the space-time partition function. So if you take the logarithm, you get the world sheet partition function. So this is a, one can therefore, Define in principle a systematic expansion of this kind, whereas S0 would be some classical entanglement piece, and I will come to that later. Because for the classical uh, uh, string theory, the one loop, sorry, the sphere diagram actually vanishes. So this relation is actually not, cannot be exactly true, and I will come, come to that uh, 
uh, come to that point about how to how to evaluate the classical piece in this untangled entropy. Uh, so at the classical level, it is not true that log of the space-time partition function is the world sheet partition function because the left-hand side is non-zero, even though the right-hand side is zero. And there are several examples. For example, if you took Schwarzschild black hole, you know that for Schwarzschild black hole, if you think of it as a well-defined conformal field theory in alpha prime expansion, then this equation is clearly not correct because the uh, space-time action, as we know, is not zero because of the given Hawking boundary term. So I think it's reasonable to assume what is true is that the bulk logarithmic term equals the space-time partition function, but there can be boundary terms which are not captured by the world sheet theory. So this, if you take that into account properly, you actually get, an, uh, by this analytic continuation, area upon 4D, which I will come, come to in a minute in top. But let me now describe very quickly the, the orbifold that we want to construct. If you have the inlet plane, and there is a vertical uh, horizontal, sorry, there's a transverse, let's say eight dimensions. So we use light cone gates. So out of those eight dimensions, we use two to fix the light cone gates. We are left with R6 cross this complex plane, which is the inlet plane, R2. And therefore, you can just split the uh, light cone gauge group, so light cone uh, rotation group as SO6 cross SO2. And then the various fields in the Green Schwartz formalism, you have a vector, which just goes as a six of the vector plus one and one minus one. There is a spinner, which goes as four with the uh, uh, charges under the SO2 a half and minus half. And then there is a conjugate spinner, which is minus half and half. This SO2, you can identify with you one, if you think of this R2 as C. And the fields uh, that are charged under this uh, rotational symmetry can get twisted. And so what is the Ormufold ZN symmetry group? It's just the rotation in the uh, two plane. And therefore it is exponential of uh, four pi i divided by n. You choose it to be four pi rather than two pi just because you have fermions. And uh, uh, if n is odd, it really doesn't matter whether you yeah, so I think it's uh, preferable to take 4 pi divided by n so that you really have an order n order four and not order 2 n order four. So uh, if you want to do 2 pi, then you have to multiply by some minus 1 to the f, something like that. So, so you want an order n order four under which the plane becomes a cone and the fermions do whatever they will do under the order full symmetry. So it's relatively straightforward to write down the partition function. So you have four fermions, and uh, notice here, they are all charged. Whereas out of these eight bosons, only these two are charged, only one complex boson is charged, and the three complex bosons are not charged, they have charge zero, whereas these fermions have charge half. So it's relatively easy to see that the, uh, the Bosons will give you the usual eta functions as you normally get. Uh, and uh, the uncharged bosons, the six of them, will give you one upon eta to the six absolute value square. And the charged bosons and the charged fermions will give you theta functions. And uh, uh, since the charge of the spinner is half the charge of the complex boson, there is a factor of two here. And as you can see, the bosons always go in the denominator, fermions go in the numerator. So it's relatively easy to, it's a simple free field theory calculation. You get the partition function to be theta to the power four, uh, some powers of eta and theta, but these arguments are different in this manner. And uh, therefore, in order to compute the entropy, we should be able to evaluate this uh, partition function over the fundamental domain. So I should indicate here that the integral is over the fundamental domain. And as is well known in string theory, the problem that you are encountering in quantum field theory is just absent from the beginning because there is no ultraviolet divergence. In quantum field theory, there was an ultraviolet divergence because if you think of this as a Schwinger parameter integral, in, in a quantum field theory, it went from zero to infinity. And 
short distance, small Schwinger parameter is ultraviolet. So you are getting a divergence because of, because of the fact that the, uh, this tau 2 to the power 5, as tau 2 goes to 0, is divergent. Uh, then you can put a cutoff, but then you have to force to put an arbitrary cutoff. Uh, whereas here in string theory, because you always have a keyhole region, tau 2 never really goes to 0. And uh, automatically, effectively, the cutoff is at the string scale. So uh, this, is, uh, this is good, you would say, because it looks like we have a very nice ultraviolet finite answer. And we should be able to calculate the entanglement entropy in string theory, which is ultraviolet finite. And we can overcome this problem that one encounters in uh, quantum field theory. However, this was noticed already a uh, long time ago that the zero orbifold, because it breaks supersymmetry, the spectrum is replete with tachyons. So even though there is no ultraviolet divergence, as I explained, because the Schwinger integral doesn't go all the way to zero, there is a natural cutoff of the order of the string scale, there is infrared divergence. And therefore, even though formally the integral is well defined, you cannot really make sense of this integral. So, of course, we know also in quantum field theory. Um, yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, sorry. The there's the other IR divergence because it's around the horizon. Being is it important that it's like the area itself was infinite? Uh, that area we have. Uh, Assume you have sort of regularized it to be you compact it in some way too. Okay, so that's yeah. So that area is not the that's not the reason for the level. Now the presence of tachyons need not be so. In general, as we understand in field theory, UV divergences are a matter of uh, normalization and regularization and so on. But IR divergences is not something that you can normalize the way. They have physics and they contain some information that you have to look at. You cannot just normalize the way. But the tachyons need not be a cause for despair because in quantum mechanics also, for example, if you have an infinite dimensional system like a Hilbert space, then uh, if you start with trace root put one normalized density matrix, then since all its eigenvalues are less than one, since they have to add up to one, this root to the power small n is expected to converge as long as uh, n is greater than one, since if, if n is an integer. However, this root to the power one upon n can diverge because you are taking, let's say, square roots of some quantity, uh, cube roots of some quantity, even though th those are original quantities are small, when you add them up, you can get a divergent answer. Uh, notice here that n is equal to trace one upon n. So what we are computing is really trace of the density matrix to the power one upon n rather than this. Uh, yeah. So that it could be, uh, if one is optimistic, that the tachyonic divergence could be taken to be a signal of the fact that this quantity is divergent, whereas this quantity, I mean, there is no a priori physical reason to expect this quantity to be convergent. You separated two directions when you made an orbit there. Yeah. Was there a reason for that? I mean, if you do C2 much, then it makes orbit force. Yeah, but the, the problem that you want to address is the Rindler space time. Right, that's so, so in the Rindler space time, you just have two directions. You don't have four directions. Um, then you would be doing something else. Yeah. So the question becomes, how can we find an analytic continuation to the physical region, which is between zero to one, given the data for n greater than one, all odd integers? We have given some ZN orbifolds for all odd integers. Can we, uh, from it, get an answer, which is, so you have some infinite number of uh, data points given to you. Now, one can actually achieve this for a simpler problem of open strings on the end of horizon. So the problem that I stated was for closed strings, but you could try to ask the question, if I have a D-brain and I want to ask the entanglement entropy of the world volume of the D-brain, and from that try to learn about the closed string sector of the theory, 
then that's a calculation that is turns out to be a lot simpler. And this was observed by, by Witten, who was able to find a, a nice analytic continuation of the annulus partition function. So you can just do the annulus instead of the uh, torus diagram. And uh, there are two simplifications. I mean, the reason we consider this uh, problem was because there are two double simplifications. But you have no twisted states in open string theory. There are no twisted states because it's an open string. Uh, so as a result, you don't have in the normal orbifold sum. If you have an n-fold orbifold, there are n square terms in the sum, and that complicates your calculation. You have a lot, a lot of terms, whereas here you have only n terms. Secondly, the open string boundary conditions relate the left movers to the right movers. So you have only have one set of oscillator modes. So the uh, whole thing looks kind of volumorphic. It's only one set of oscillators, and it's not two sets of oscillators. And so by using some kind of a generalization of the Sommerfeld Watson method that you might have seen in StatMic, uh, Witten was able to obtain uh, an analytic continuation whose uniqueness was guaranteed by Carlson's theorem. So Carlson's theorem is just to give you uh, you know, if I give you, suppose, a function and all its derivatives evaluated at a point, that's just a discrete data. Uh, but if you, if you know that the function is analytic in some domain, you know, using uh, Taylor, Taylor expansion, using uh, uh, Taylor expansion of the function, you can recover the value of the function at all points. So basically, uh, the Carlson's theorem is so Cauchy's theorem, or you know, the normal complex analysis ensures that just knowing the derivatives of the function at a given point allows you to construct the whole function, you know, analytic function in a domain. So from integral integer data, you can construct an analytic function. Carlson theorem is a bit like that: is that given the data at the integers, certain integers, it tells you that under certain conditions, uh, growth conditions. Uh, uh, if you manage to get an uh, analytic continuation, it is unique. Another way to say that is that if a function vanishes at all the integer points under certain uh, uh, growth conditions on the real axis, then Carlson's theorem states that it vanishes everywhere in the, in the right half. So, uh, uh, so now if you look at the answer that uh, Witten found, one can try to access the closed string sector by viewing the annulus as a conformally equivalent cylinder diagram in the usual way. The open string, you're doing the calculation as a trace in the open string channel, but you can look at it in the closed string channel as an exchange of closed string. And since we know that the closed string has tachyons, uh, this answer does have tachyons, and there are tachyonic divergences. But then, since we are, uh, one has now, an analytic continuation, one can, even though for n greater than one, there are tachyons in the closed string channel, quite interestingly, there are no tachyons in the physically interesting regime, which goes from zero and one. Corresponding to the physical uh, region, uh, small n bigger than one. So capital N less than or equal to one corresponds to small n bigger than one, which is what we need for doing a, a replica trick with, uh, uh, with uh, in full cover. So this is encouraging. And so it's quite interesting that, and I think it's non-trivial that somehow the open string sector is telling you that even though the tachyons are present in the capital N greater than one, they're absent in n less than or equal to one. So can we do the analytic continuation of the closed strings? Now this turns out to be, it's a considerably harder problem. And at the moment, we do not have an analytic continuation of the full partition function. Fortunately, as I will explain, it turns out, I mean, this is the observation that I want to give you with, that the tachyonic terms have a very specific structure. And those divergent terms that we are encountering, those terms actually do allow for a resummation and an analytic continuation uh, to the uh, to the regime of interest where it is perfectly finite. It's a 
I think it's a quite uh, interesting indication that uh, the entropy defined in this manner will turn out to be finite in CK. But before going there, I just want to quickly remind you of the classical entanglement entropy. See, as I told you, uh, uh, we don't know how to compute uh, this zero uh, genus zero term just from the world sheet calculation. However, one can give this following uh, space-time argument, which would be quite similar to what you would see for a Schwarzschild black hole, but here it's, we are using it in a different way. Uh, but you expect that for this cone, you think of a string, string theory, string field theory, or uh, on the space-time string fields, then we know that uh, there is, because this uh, orbifold is an exact conformal field theory, the dilaton equations of motion are satisfied exactly, and there is no tadpole of the dilaton. And we know that the classical bulk action has to have e to the minus two phi sitting in front. So whatever is multiplying it, and, and then I have uh, denoted it uh, qualitatively in terms of some tachyon potential, but whatever is multiplying it must be zero because uh, otherwise you'll get a tadpole for the tachyon. So this argument tells you that unlike in canonical quantum uh, canonical gravity, where uh, a cone is not really a solution of Einstein's equations, string theory tells you that this is actually an exact equation solution of Einstein's, uh, string theory equations of motion. And in particular, the Lilliton equation is, uh, is satisfied. And therefore, this term must be exactly zero. And then we are left with this. Uh, uh, however, as we know, very well, uh, there has to be a curvature term, sorry, uh, uh, the given Hawking term, which depends on the extensive curvature. And there can be, of course, alpha prime corrections, but by just power counting, they're going to be suppressed as you take the radius to go to infinity, they will be less and less important. So you can argue that the logarithm of the uh, space-time partition function must be given by area upon 4G times one upon N minus one, because you can evaluate the uh, extensive curvature to be uh, you know, two pi over n or something like that. And uh, this allows you to argue that because there are not dilaton type poles, there must be a contribution to the uh, entropy which goes like this. And I want to emphasize here that here this calculation really has nothing to do with a black hole or a holography. This could be just viewed as a generalization of von Neumann entropy in quantum gravity even though we defined it in this indirect way quite, and I hesitated to call it von Neumann entropy because we don't really know how to define von Neumann entropy, but it is some very natural notion of uh, quantum entropy, entanglement entropy and string theory, which automatically gives you this area term as the classical piece. But it does not, of course, give you any, uh, uh, as we all know that in the perturbative string theory, you don't get any state interpretation of this formula but it naturally gives you a formula that we have encountered before from the holographic consideration in a very natural way. And then the question becomes, since we're getting this piece very nicely, can we make sense of this quantum piece, which has this tachyonic divergence? When you're getting that, that piece, what you're getting is way very similar to how you get it in Einstein gravity, right? Yes. Because... However, the difference is that uh, for example, if you had a Schwarzschild black hole with a real uh, with a cigar geometry, then it would really be like the, the two calculations are identical. See, yeah. here the difference is that you are not putting any brain or something by hand. The fact that the equations of motion of the dilaton are satisfied is a fact that you cannot argue in Einstein's gravity. Right, but in Einstein gravity, we also the boundary term the P0 and the equations of motion, you get the whole answer from the boundary term. If, okay. but not for the conical geometry. You would get that only for, let's say, something like a Schwarzschild geometry where it's actually a solution of the equation of motion. The conical geometry has a curvature singularity here. Yeah, if you just evaluate R, there is a curvature singularity. Well, I guess in Einstein gravity, we have to argue that you don't include the, that curvature. Yeah, but here, okay. uh, yeah, I think that's the difference. I would say that. Yeah, I mean, we also know that cone is not a solution of Euclidean Einstein gravity. 
but it is a solution of string theory. So I think even though they look rather similar, I think conceptually they're quite different. In one case, it really is a solution of string equations of motion, and the electron tells you that it is not that full, even though you don't have to look inside what is there. It can have all kinds of alpha prime corrections. But we know exactly the electron equations are satisfied. This is something that is difficult to argue in canonical way. But I agree that they are, they are quite similar, but their origin and interpretation is quite different. Uh, now let's come to the analytic contribution of tachyons. The tachyons have uh, turned out to have, if you just look at the tachyonic terms, so the tachyons are basically exponentially growing terms in this integral that we want to do. So if they're exponentially growing as a function of tau two, so we can do some Fourier expansion in the tau, tau one, and we get some Fourier expansion like that. So f of tau is some e to the two pi. And if you do the tau one integral, uh, especially when you're looking at large tau two, we can forget about this keyhole region. And then the partition function is basically the zero mode of this, uh, the zero Fourier mode of this uh, of, you know, modular integrand. And we just look at the exponentially growing terms in this, which correspond to tachyons. And they turn out to have this particular form. So if you look at the tachyonic terms, they look like exponential of four pi tau two k upon n. This is the leading tachyon in every, uh, in the k-twisted sector, the ground state energy basically goes as minus uh, 2k upon n. And this is exponential of minus 2 pi tau two times the energy of the state. So the energy of the leading tachyon, the ground state in the k-twisted sector is negative and it's minus 2k upon n, which is this leading tachyon. However, in addition, you can act with oscillators on this, and you can get many subleading tachyons. So you actually get a fairly intricate structure. You would, I mean, you do get lots of tachyons. It's not just the ground state tachyons. So in each k-twisted sector, you have a ground state and a whole tower of uh, subleading tachyonic states, and their masses are given like that, and so you can uh, sum it over like that. You can write it like that. Now this, uh, now of course, uh, uh, this sum, we, I'm taking it to infinity, but it actually stops uh, because beyond that point, the states are actually non-tachyonic, but we don't care about, I mean, we are interested in the diversion terms. It's, it's easier to take this sum to go to infinity, but we are not making any, uh, we are including all the tachyons plus some additional states. And then this integral sum can be very quickly performed using the famous geometric sum, and uh, you get this answer. So the tachyonic sum can be recast in this manner, r going from zero to infinity, where n minus one appears in this very specific way, where alpha r is a quantity which depends on this r that's being integrated, which is positive. And since r is positive uh, and n is greater than zero, the whole thing actually has a tachyonic divergence when n is greater than one, but it is perfectly finite when n is less than one. This tells you that there is something nice happening in string theory. And remarkably, the uh, tachyonic terms have no exponentially growing terms, if you can analytically, which you can, these terms you can analytically continue to the. So much like what happens for the open strings, uh, open sync case that was analyzed. Here, even though we don't have a full analytically continued answer, uh, the tachyonic terms that indicate that they can be analytically continued to a very specific function, the geometric sum, such that uh, in the physical domain, there are no tachyonic divergences. So therefore, now you can split the uh, integrand into this tachyonic piece and the remainder. The remainder now, by construction, has no divergences. And therefore, you can perform the integral in the keyhole region perfectly uh, without any problem. And the tachyonic integral you can, cannot really perform. But if you analytic, so you can put a cutoff, actually, there is a way to put a modular invariant cutoff. You can define this integral first with a cutoff and then analytically continue it to n less than one. Where this answer automatically analytically continues. And this answer in the cutoff theory, 
it is actually going to diverge if you took the cutoff to infinity, but when you take n less than one, it turns out to be finite. So in the, by doing this little bit of trickery, you actually get, managed to get a finite answer. Now I want to emphasize that this does not, uh, is not accidental, this analytic continuation depends on three quite important just so properties of the string algo form. So it was very cr crucial that there are exactly n minus one twisted sectors, each containing tachyons. If we had n plus one twisted sectors or n twisted sectors, this would not work. Moreover, it was necessary that in the k twisted sector, there is precisely one leading tachyon and whose mass square is linear in, uh, in k. Also, there are many subleading tachyons, but you can check that they all have unit multiplicity and their mass is also linear. So the fact that this linearity of mass square with the twisted sector k, the fact that you have only n minus twisted sectors, and the fact that you have all the subleading tachyons coming with unit multiplicity, they together conspire to give you this rather simple formula. And therefore, it's given our experience with string theory. I think uh, uh, I mean the experience with string theory says that one should try, one should listen to what the string is trying to tell you. So, uh, therefore, to uh, check whether this is really a generic feature, we consider generic Calabi of compactification. So, in this 10 dimensional case, our ability to obtain this finite analytic continuation in the physical region, as I said, depended on a very specific structure of the tachyonic spectrum. Now, a natural question is that is this a feature of just the 10 dimensional superstring, or is this more generally valid? Like for a Calabi of compactification. If it was only true in 10 dimensions, then this would not be a very useful method. And in particular, if you have some, for example, if you take Calabria, which are themselves orbifolds, there is a possibility that there could be additional tachyons. And it's far from obvious, a priori, that those tachyons would also follow, will have the similar structure. So we considered a few examples. So we, for example, we considered Calabria threefold, T6 mod Z3. Uh, so you can take the eight, nine with the light cone directions, zero, one to the linear plane, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven is the T6. Uh, you can take it to be this SU3 lattice. And then there is a rotation, uh, uh, order three rotation in these various planes, which is, uh, has SU3 holonomy because the sum of the traces, the determinant of this is one. So we get uh, the usual T T6 mod Z3 compactification, and then we perform this Rindler uh, construction of a conical or before cone. And uh, there is a danger now that there are new tachyons and the doubly twisted sectors. So you can take a sector which is t to the power r, g to the power k. But in this particular example, one finds that all states in these sectors are either massless or massive. And therefore, the analytic continuation n works exactly as in 10 dimensions. Then we consider another example on a k3, which is t4 mod z3. And now, however, one finds that there are actually new tachyons. So if you consider T4 mod Z3, there are, in fact, additional tachyons in the doubly twisted sector. And their ground state energies look like this. So they have some somewhat complicated structure. So depending on the range of K upon N, you and you can see that in this range, since K upon N is less, uh, one third is less than K upon N, this is a tachyonic state. In this particular case, now we are encountering more tachyons in the twisted sectors. And it's not clear at all that the method that whether the tachyons will behave in the same way as they did before. So one can once again look at the tachyons and uh, they have this structure. We can take this uh, again, the limit we go to infinity by including some massive and massless states that doesn't change the tachyonic analysis. And we again switch the order and do the k sum first as we did before. We can, there, now there is a floor function, so there is some more complication, and it looks like it depends on whether uh, n is uh, 0 mod 3, 1 mod 3, or 2 mod 3. Apparently, it looks like that you could get different answers, and it's not even clear a priori whether they actually will uh, have some nice behavior in n less than 1. 
But it turns out that uh, uh, all these ambiguities are not important because they are related by just addition of massive or massless states. And therefore, once again, we find that also in, in these mixed tachyonic uh, states, you can perform the sum as before. And it all comes down to this amazing formula of geometric sum, the sum going from one to n minus, as x is going to zero, this has a nice limit when n is less than one. So we get this expression where rho is e to the power minus two pi tau two. So rho is going to zero in the infrared as tau two is going to infinity. And this function is divergent when n is less than, greater than one, but it is well behaved when it, n is less than one. So I would say that there is good evidence that the entanglement entropy computed using this obliful method, which is a stringy analog of replica method is finite and calculable. This feature seems to continue for a generic Calabria compactification with less supersymmetry. So it should be something that is uh, worth exploring further. I just want to now end with a quick comment about the holography and entanglement. For example, one can now, uh, if you look at, let's say, uh, a two-sided black hole, Consider this thermophile double considered by one, then uh, the again this bifurcate horizon is for a large uh, radius of the ADS uh, space is again like a real observer. And here we have a holographic uh, dual to compare with. And here we know that if you trace over the left movers completely, which corresponds to uh, having a thermal state in the right moving Hilbert space, one can ask, you get basically thermal density matrix, and the thermal density matrix has a, some dependence on N and the Atuf coupling, which has a nice expansion in N and in large N and uh, large Atuf coupling, which is like the alpha prime and G string expansion. And this should be compared with uh, the calculation one would obtain so another way to say that is the calculation that I'm describing in the large ADS5 radius can be viewed as the bulk analog of the boundary uh, entanglement entropy that one encounters here. But as I emphasized before, uh, uh, and there we know that the structure that we encountered before is exactly the structure that we need. And as I emphasized before, the definition using the orbifold uh, method really does not make any reference to either holography or to black holes. In some sense, it is really could be thick. I think it, <laughs> all indications are that the black hole entropy also, in some sense, is just this entanglement entropy because it has the area. I mean, so black hole entropy, I would say, is a special case of this entropy because you get generically for any uh, area, you get this area upon 4G term from this computation, and there is a quantum correction. So, uh, so I, I, I think that it's an interesting uh, fact that uh, the entropy obtained by using this obliful method is, can be both is definitely UV convergent, but also can be made higher convergent by this procedure. And this is something that needs to be explored for. So this is what I'll stop here. Any questions for Tisha? Could you say again uh, why you were saying that n between zero and one is the physically relevant region? Yeah, so the, the argument is that I mean just by analogy in quantum mechanics, if you have so this root, this trace. Just yeah, the, trace root to the power one, these eigenvalues are less than, let's say, one upon three or something. One okay, I, I understood yeah. this. this uh, yeah, so so if you want the like Renyi entropies for n less than one to, to be infinite, this means you have like infinite number of eigenvalues, right? Uh, so like you have infinite dimensional space. So I don't see why you wouldn't expect for n larger than one, because you can have infinite entropy just because you have an infinite dimensional space, nothing, nothing crazy is happening. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, but it's the fact that uh, you have a divergence when n is greater than one 
it just corresponds to n small so n was one upon n so n is less than one well, yeah, what, what i'm saying is that I, I think it's it's much stronger statement to say that i mean you can have n like you can have entropy in an infinite dimensional system you would need an infinite dimensional system for little n to be uh to blow up or sorry so, yeah, you, what's finite is the trace of what power of rho? Uh, trace rho to the power of small n is bigger than one. That's a, an ordinary quantity. So you expect that to be true. Yeah, you don't yeah, know that's what it is. Yeah. You don't know if the trace should be finite if the exponent is less than. So, what we find is that uh, this tachyonic analytic continuation shows that. This is true, even though this is not true, which is okay. Even in normal quantum mechanics, you can easily construct situations where this is true, but this is not necessarily true. Yeah, and what John is saying is that if the entropy is finite, we expect it to be true also for a test of for, Yeah, for example, in this example, uh, if you did n less than one, there's no problem going past 10, like in the thermal field of mm -hmm. No, you. Have, you, if you look at the like Renyi entropy for n less than one of CFT, it's just a higher temperature thermal entropy, but it's it's just as finite. There's no like special thing that happens at any one of It just seems like a very strong constraint for things to blow up at n equals one. It's interesting. Yeah, so you're saying that there is a holographic there is a holographic situation where this quantity also happens to be, uh, sorry, so trace root to the power of one of them. Yeah, they're all finite unless you take any finite for this. Yeah. Even though a priori, you don't expect that to be the case. I don't know, it's just a thermal entropy in, in the case that you have on the board. Uh, the uh, entanglement entropy equals a thermal entropy, so it's just free scaling beta. Uh, and there's nothing special that happens at a certain value of beta. And you could say you, you might expect it to be true a priori uh, in ring that space because you don't get any problem from infinity where the circle grows. Whatever you have at the origin is supposed to be finite. So. Uh, so surprising. But you're getting the tactics from the whatever you get at the origin. Yeah. I think, uh, you're saying that from the holographic point of view, there should be no tachyons. Or there should be no from, uh, from the point of view that forget about holography, just in the here yeah, in this calculation, we are saying the entropy is finite. Yeah. Right. yeah. That means there is some inverse space that's finite dimensional. But you might you might worry about the, the infinite dimension. Hilbert space could be infinite dimensional. Well, like yeah. in quantum mechanics. Well, okay, then. But then no Renyi entropy should be need to be finite. Even the ones like because trace row equals one doesn't mean that trace like you know one over one minus n log trace row to the n is finite for n larger than one. So yeah, you can still have it be infinite dimensional helpers. It's then everything could blow up and nothing's being violated. Anyway, it, it is an, it's interesting that things blow up at n equals one. Mm -hmm. Interesting comment that that holography is a holography the computation would be different, right? If you make n smaller, you just consider a different black hole, you don't do a quotient of this black hole. I think the, the divergence is related to the fact that this cosmic brain is going to decay. That's they will decay, and after it decays, it goes over to the the new black hole at the different temperature that John was talking about. I don't know if it's common. But... Yeah, I think you, you could be, I mean, even in uh, EDS3, for example, you have to figure EDS3, I would think that you would take the ZM always full of the You can construct the orbifold. What I was saying is that the set and orbifold it's 
Yeah, the name to be is, has an N N greater than one. So our referral will not give you the name. Well, but even even I'm, I'm talking about the constant flow, let's say polarity of gravity. So the those Riemann entropies are computed by smooth geometries. The ones that result after this cosmic rain decays, decay uh -huh. something, and then result of the decay is some new geometry that is the one that's supposed to compute the, the rainy entropy. Yes, I agree. But then you are in the regime and greater than or equal to one because you're taking a stack of replica. Well, I, I would say that in both regimes where you are n bigger than one or smaller than one, the, the trace are brought to the end. Gravity is computed by taking this cosmic rain that we take and condensing the tachyons and going to a new geometry, which is small, just a small geometry. That that's that's what we normally do when but you say condensing the tachyon what is actually doing? Well they, they are all they are these uh, clustering tachyons. So yeah, well, you have to find some minimum. Yeah, you find the new minimum and the idea is that the new minimum well I, I don't know how to find it explicitly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I think <laughs> people have tried and it's not easy to find it. <laughs> I mean, well, I try well, but in situations like uh, like the yes, so the fact that there will be an minimum that will be like for the different temperature. Yes, I and then you temperature. Right. Okay. Okay. And then you take the difference between the two or something like that to calculate. Yeah, well, that's the free measure of that gives you. Yeah, that's the same. But that's, but that's basically taking in some way the with respect to n. Yeah, this is just a comment that. Uh, yeah, that's good. Maybe this was my my question. So what what maybe you said it and I missed it. What's the what's the what was the gravity interpretation of your uh, your IR split? Uh, I mean, from the point of view of the, it's just a tachyonic diverging. If you don't have supersymmetry, you can have tachyon. I don't, I don't have a better physical interpretation. So just the condensation tachyon, the one was such? Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, you okay. could interpret them as a, some kind of Hagenon tachyon. Basically, you are having temperature, which are, and which are localized because the temperature is diverging near the type of the, you could interpret them as Hagenon tachyons, which, but to do something, yeah, it's more than that. I okay, maybe one can. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so respectfully, the um, you have both maybe the open strings. When you're thinking about entanglement, since it, since your vacuum diagrams include the sphere diagram, that there is a contribution that is that this happen. Basically, you still get stuck on that. And this is like the uh, Uglam, yeah. and Uglam kind of so, so is that, yeah. yeah. But I think Saskan and Uglam, I think it's difficult to see how you get one upon d squared. Okay. No, so you want to think of it as like, uh, yeah, I know the Saskan and Uglam picture. Yeah. 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 But will it give you one upon d squared? That's not really I think the argument, yeah, yeah. If, if the one of this way is the dominant one, yeah, okay, fine, that's good. Yeah, but this this would give you not one of them, and that was always my issue. With. And Saskia and the heuristic picture is correct, right. I think, but it's not clear to me that you get one of them. If yeah. you do it this way, you don't get it. Ah, really. <laughs> but now it's yeah. Questions? If not, I remind people we're going to dinner at six. Anyone who wants to come, send me an email. Second. Yeah.